To start, let me ask you a question. Are the 2017 Little Nightmares comics canon? Now, regardless of your answer, consider this. How do you know? The canonical standing of the comics has been a subject of much debate ever since they were released, and over the years this discussion has expanded to include other projects like Very Little Nightmares, the Digital Comics series, and most recently, the Sounds of Nightmares podcast. With Little Nightmares 3 coming out in the near future and the inevitable flood of content that will follow, I think now is a good time to examine how we approach and talk about canon in the context of lore and theory crafting. And so today I'll be sharing my own thoughts on the matter in an attempt to clear up some misconceptions and address some of the reasons why this topic is so controversial. But before getting to that, let's first establish what canon actually means. In general terms, canon refers to anything accepted and or recognized as part of an official fictional universe. Simple enough, right? Except, what do accepted and recognized even mean in this context? Who has the last word? The truth is, the vast majority of projects in the game industry aren't given a certified canon label upon release, and there's no one individual or committee tasked with announcing this information either. Publishers just release things, and then we engage with those things. The decision of what is or isn't canon is largely a collective consensus, and I think this is where the root of the debate lies. So, acknowledging the inherent ambiguity in this topic, my goal with this video is not to brazenly define the canon of Little Nightmares. I am certainly not qualified to do that, but rather to propose a general framework for approaching and understanding it. There are three categories in which I believe nearly all things pertaining to the IP fall. Official productions, cut content, and media presence. Number 1. Official productions under the Bandai Namco umbrella are canon unless and until they are unequivocally declared not to be so. I'm defining official productions here as projects created and distributed with the resources and approval of Bandai Namco, who owns the Little Nightmares IP. Since Bandai doesn't explicitly say whether their productions are canon or not, I think it's reasonable to assume that everything they produce is canon unless proven otherwise. Something like Disney's rebranding of the Star Wars EU as Star Wars Legends in 2014 would qualify as a declaration of this nature. Number 2. Cut content is not canon unless and until it is specifically declared to be so. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Content that was iterated on during the development process but ultimately dropped from the final product is obviously obsolete. Number 3. Media presence is variable and may or may not be considered canon. I'm using the term media presence here to include things like developer interviews, official social media activity, and other online publications. Sources of information that are not in the games, nor adjacent to the games, but rather about the games. This is a true grey area and is subject to debate on a case-by-case -case basis. So these are the categories I came up with. They are by no means all-encompassing or conclusive, but at the very least they should provide a good foundation for this discussion, and in the next section I'll be going through each one in detail to explain my reasoning. Do be warned, there are very mild spoilers for the Sounds of Nightmares podcast ahead, but let's be honest, you've already listened to it, haven't you? First and foremost in this category is Little Nightmares, which was released in April 2017 and tells the story of Six's ascension through the Maw, with three additional chapters, known collectively as Secrets of the Maw, added in July, November, and then February of the following year, focusing on the parallel journey of a new character, the Runaway Kid. The title and its DLC were developed by Swedish studio Tarsier and is obviously canon as it kicked off the Little Nightmares universe. Next up is Very Little Nightmares, a mobile game developed by Spanish studio Alike and released in May of 2019. It is also canon, being officially produced under Bandai and intended to serve as a prequel to the original game, despite being created by a different studio with minimal input from Tarsier. When asked about his involvement with the game in an interview, Dave Mervik, the senior narrative designer for Little Nightmares at Tarsier, said the following. I had a bit of uh, involvement there, I mean, but it came from them, like what they wanted to do. I think I wrote lore a little bit, but I think they even did that. I think I helped with some of the names for the characters, but I had very little involvement there. I think that was them and they were probably just working more closely with Bandai, who obviously know the IP as well. But I think it was just maybe I consulted here and there, you know, if they just wanted a bit of feedback or bounce some ideas off or whatever, but it was minimal my involvement there. Uh, oh, and the studio itself, you know, that was their, their baby. 
As Mervik acknowledges, Bandai knew the IP and were free to use it as they saw fit, even when that involved giving creative liberties to another studio on a brand new project that overlapped with his work. A few years later, in February of 2021, Little Nightmares received a mainline sequel, which also happened to be a prequel, in Little Nightmares 2, developed once again by Tarzir. The game featured both Six and new character Mono on a journey to discover the secrets of the Signal Tower and added substantially to the existing canon. Released alongside the game in January and February of 2021 were the Little Nightmares digital comics created by Thai comic studio Plastique. The six-episode series was officially produced under Bandai and is directly associated with Little Nightmares 2, providing additional backstory on Mono, Six, and some of the glitched kid remains that can be found in the game. As such, it clearly fits into the canon. And speaking of comics, let's now address the Little Nightmares print comics, which were announced in 2017, before the first game even came out, actually, and had two issues released in May and July of that same year. They were and are canon, being officially produced under Bandai as a collaboration with British company Titan Comics and fully intended to serve as a tie-in with the first game as a myriad of sources show. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Weren't those cancelled and decanonized, like, a long time ago? Well, yes and no. Issues number 3 and 4 were unfortunately cancelled for reasons that remain unknown to this day, but the notion that the existing issues were somehow nullified is all but baseless. This rumor stems from two main sources, an obscure email interview that content creator Arcane Static had with Dave Mervick in 2018, and an equally obscure recorded interview that content creator Crit Hit had with Mervick in 2021, both of which I've linked in the video description below. Let's start with Crit Hit's interview, skipping to a section 23 minutes in. I was sort of curious as to like how much of those, like their presence can be seen, felt, or hinted at in the main game. I would say the digital comics are more of a reflection of what we would want to do, what, what we wanted to do outside of the games. I would say the print comics less so. The digital comics I was involved with, I'm very proudly involved with, with that. Um, I kind of basically wrote a premise for each of the digital comics, you know, for each of the characters that you play through. Uh, and then they were sent to Plastique, who did just a phenomenal job of translating that to the silent animated digital comics that you're seeing for this game. So here Mervik frankly states his opinion that the digital comics are superior, which is perfectly understandable seeing how he wrote them all himself, while not being involved with the print comics whatsoever. Crit Hit then continues on to ask directly about the canonicity of the print comics, and Mervik just straight up doesn't respond, so he moves on to another question. Based on this exchange, it seems evident that Mervik doesn't agree with the direction taken in the print comics, and maybe even doesn't like to think of them as canon. But the thing is, does he really have the final say on what is or is not Little Nightmare's canon? I don't think so. In this very interview, Mervik repeatedly defers to Bandai as the ones in charge of the Little Nightmares IP, just as he did in the clip regarding Very Little Nightmares I referenced earlier. It's also worth mentioning, of course, that he isn't involved with the IP at all anymore since Tarzir is now owned by Embracer Group. Clearly the canon goes beyond just him. On that note, let's now take a listen to the Arcane Static interview, skipping to a question 13 minutes in. So to what degree are the events in the comics considered canon for the game? Which parts can be useful in decoding the mysteries we have left to decode? I think we alluded to this in the second comic. Children's memories aren't always reliable, but then, neither are narrators. As Arcane Static goes on to say in the video, this is not a statement of the comics not being canon so much as a warning that the information contained within them is not to be trusted. But many people interpreted it that way nonetheless. The funny thing is, this wasn't even much of a revelation at all. Page 3 of the comics includes a short description that basically says the same thing. The following tales are faint memories, recollections of the children's life outside the Maw, told to the best of their ability. Which brings us to an extremely important point, perhaps the most important point I want to make in this video. Just because something is canon, that does not make it true. Unreliable narration is a recurring theme in Little Nightmares, which is unsurprising considering its Lovecraftian influences, and what this means is that canonical storytelling can be used to communicate misleading information. To their credit, the comics are perfectly candid regarding the unreliable narration contained within, and we don't have to look very far to find other examples of this in the Little Nightmares universe. 
After being dormant for two and a half years, the Little Nightmares IP was revitalized by the launch of the Sounds of Nightmares podcast, a series of six episodes that aired in August and September of 2023. It is described in the podcast itself thus. You're listening to The Sounds of Nightmares, an audio fiction series from the world of Little Nightmares. The series is firmly canon, being officially produced under Bandai by Lonnie Nadler, who served as its showrunner and lead writer. The various episodes were written by him, Supermassive Games, content creators It's Just Jord and Super Horror Bro, and several others, and tell the story of Noon, a young girl plagued by nightmares who seeks help at a local psychiatric institute. Similarly to the children of the print comics, Noon recalls her experiences within the nowhere to the best of her ability, but we are meant to understand that her retellings are not entirely complete or reliable, and neither are her or Otto's interpretations of what they could mean. But that does not make them any less canon. This brings us finally to the upcoming Little Nightmares 3. The game is currently being developed by UK-based studio Supermassive Games, which previously developed the enhanced version of Little Nightmares 2, and will follow two new characters, Low and Alone, on their journey through a mysterious place called The Spiral. And of course, the title will be canon, as it is officially produced under Bandai Namco. The most accessible form of cut content in Little Nightmares is concept art, which is integrated directly into both mainline games. In Little Nightmares 1, collectibles unlock art pieces in the main menu gallery, and the deluxe version of Little Nightmares 2 includes an art book outright. By definition, the images found within are not canon. They are but glimpses into the development process and the many, many iterations it takes to realize the artistic vision for a game. Ideas that could have been, but are not. Even concept art that does depict elements of the final product can't always be taken at face value. For example, there are leeches in the Maw, but none that we see have legs. The so-called Barber from Little Nightmares 2 concept art does exist in the world, as proven by a portrait from the residence, but not necessarily in the way in which he appears here. While most concept art is shared directly by the developers themselves, the second major source of cut content, data mining, is not. Data mining is defined as the act of sifting through a game's files and code to find information that does not appear in the game itself, which can include things like asset file names, character models, state secrets, and much more. By definition, content discovered in this way is not canon, and Dave Mervick shared his own thoughts on the matter with Arcane Static in the same 2018 interview. Since our last interview, more and more people have been using the data mining process to try to find out more than the normal gameplay would give us. Has your opinion changed on that matter? He says, I don't have massively strong feelings for or against data mining, and it's common to look elsewhere for meaning when it's not been laid out neatly in front of you. The fact remains, though, that we released a game, and that is what we stand behind. Anything else should be taken with a fistful of salt. It is something a fellow Dreamweaver might call additionata. As intriguing as some of this information might be, ultimately, it is still content that did not make it into the final product, and should be regarded as such. This third section is where things get a bit tricky. It's easy enough to understand why Little Nightmares 2 is canon, and this drawing of a freaky flesh tube is not. But what about something like developer interviews? Just type Little Nightmares Interview into Google and you'll end up with dozens of results spanning the last seven years, many of which are quite fascinating. Some are casual and hosted by journalists or content creators, like the ones I've referenced in this video, while others are officially produced for publicity and marketing purposes. But how much credence should we give to the things they say? Well, there are a few factors to consider here. For starters, credit where credit is due, the developers generally do a good job of not answering questions related to the lore itself. In an interview with Gaming Bible in 2021, Dave Mervick said that he tries to keep a healthy distance from fan theories since he doesn't want to color the lore's natural path. As a result, what little they do say tends to feel pretty credible, including an interesting comment Mervick makes later in the same interview. This is a world that takes real experiences and twists them into unfamiliar shapes, so what they have become here is as important as what they were. Definitely something to think about. On the other end of the interference spectrum, we have things like the recent producer interview with Coralie Faniello, which is full of lore bombshells. As the previous games, Little Nightmares 3 takes place in the nowhere, which is the nightmare's place of Little Nightmares. While that statement might come across as presumptuous at first, it really isn't. 
This highly polished and lightly scripted interview was officially produced by Bandai for the marketing campaign of Little Nightmares 3, and as such everything revealed in it was almost certainly approved beforehand, rendering it canonical. Probably. Something else about this interview that sets it apart is the way it was posted on the official Little Nightmares Twitter, or X account, which brings us to a whole other discussion. Are Twitter posts canon? There's no denying the fact that the Little Knights account is carefully managed, with every post being very deliberately worded, and a significant number of them hint at aspects of the lore with potentially massive implications. As a result, it usually feels like a legitimate source of canon information. But there's one problem. Remember that pesky, unreliable narration I brought up earlier? For many years now, Little Knights has pretended to be diegetic, an actual part of the Little Nightmares world, consistently referring to its followers as children or little ones. The implication is that we are hearing from the Signal Tower itself, or based on what we know now from the podcast, perhaps another powerful being from nowhere. Someone or something who certainly can't be trusted to tell us the truth. So while I think there's good reason to treat the official Twitter as canon, everything it says should absolutely be questioned. In this final section, I want to briefly acknowledge some important elements of canon that didn't come up earlier. First, canon does change over time. As new projects are added to an existing body of work, ideas change, art styles change, and things that may once have been considered canon fall by the wayside. For example, in 2018, once again pulling from the Arcane Static interview, Dave Mervick said that the Ferrymen and Wax Bellmen were completely different characters. But one year earlier, in 2017, the official Twitter had said the exact opposite, asserting that they were one and the same. While this might just be a contradiction, it could also point to an evolution, the canon shifting to accommodate new stories that had yet to be told. On a related note, there's also the idea of headcanon, what you personally accept to be true, whether or not others agree, or even whether or not it makes sense. And there's absolutely a place for this. Ultimately, we as fans engage with stories and lore for fun because they make us feel something, whether that be happy, devastated, hopeful, or even… hungry. If a certain headcanon for a story brings closure to you or otherwise helps you enjoy it more, then I think that's great. The one caveat here is that headcanon should always be presented as such, and this segues nicely into the main takeaway I want to leave with you. Always cite your sources. Personally, I think every single one of the categories listed in this video are valid sources for crafting theories, but it's important to say where you are getting your information from or else misinformation can spread very easily. This is exactly what happened with the print comics. Following their cancellation, people began saying they were no longer canon, including moderators of the Little Nightmares Reddit, but never actually provided a source for this assertion. The Little Nightmares Wiki has a page dedicated to the comics that acknowledges the controversy over their canonicity and even quotes the Arcane Static interview, but fails to include a link to the video or other information that might help people find it. It also incorrectly attributes the quote to the writers when the statement was made only by Mervik himself. As a result of these muddied waters, when the Sounds of Nightmares podcast came out last summer, I noticed an influx of people asking, wait, are the comics canon again? The thing is, they kinda always were canon, and I think this distinction matters quite a bit. As anyone who has listened to it will know, the Sounds of Nightmares podcast pulls very important elements from the comics, and based on the revealed trailer for Little Nightmares 3, it seems quite likely that game will do so as well. For all we know, fascinating characters like the North Wind and Mirror Monster could play an integral part of the new story, and may finally be regarded with the canonicity they always deserved. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you'd like to see more Little Nightmares content from this channel, then be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. I'll be launching a series of lore and theory videos soon focused on the podcast and Little Nightmares 3, and would love to see you there.